This week, I'm giving it to you unfiltered, unedited, and raw. I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape, Global 20 Vaping News Science and Advocacy Report for the week ending August 13th, 2021. Yeah, this week, it's a visceral vaping news science and advocacy report. You know, I published the first ever Five Minute Friday on August 27th. August 27th of last year. It may have taken me an hour to research the stories for that short format report. A meager seven minutes to record it and less than an hour to edit the video for YouTube. Now, compare that with last week's Global 20 report, which I started as soon as the previous report got uploaded. Every day, I spent at least an hour researching to find new and relevant stories and making images from the news. Next came another eight to 10 hours organizing and scripting the stories so it flows and it makes sense to you, the viewer. Then another full day of editing to come up with a 30 minute production that got less views than the first ever vaping news on this channel. It doesn't make any sense to me how a shitty seven minute recording has more views than a 30 minute video that took almost 30 hours to produce. Unless people just don't really care about vaping news. You know, the definition of insanity is doing the exact same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So this week, it's a visceral vaping news report. Raw, unedited vaping news science and advocacy for those of you who really do care about what's going on in the world. Ain't nothing to it. But to get into it. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, here we are before us today. Phil Morris is continuing their little adventure into the pharmacological aspect of business. To make money on the suffering of its customers. Who cares? We uh, got them lung cancer and, you know, heart attacks and strokes. But you know what? What better way to make more money and more profit off of these Italy, these people that used to be our customers? We'll keep them our customers by going out and, you know, treating them with our drugs and our inhalation therapies. Makes perfect sense, right? Yeah. Philip Morris International acquires an inhaled drug specialist Optitopic growing pipeline of beyond nicotine inhaled therapeutic products, therapeutic products. Ugh. The truth butter has the rage sweat flowing already. You wonder why it takes me so long to get the news done. I get so worked up and so furious over some of the things that I see and I read. And then I find out that, you know, these advocacy groups are saying, Oh, well, we need to do this for the kids. Meanwhile, they're totally ignoring what's really going on and what the real problems are in society. What kind of world do we live in? This is not what I was promised when I was growing up as a kid. There's nothing like it. But people are too ignorant to what's obviously going around and around them to even look, to understand. Ethical concerns is big tobacco hustles into health care. They're a big corporation. They only care about making money. Do you think that they really care about ethics? Despite what they teach in college courses, the people that actually go and get the degrees don't get the jobs as a CEO because they do have ethics and they do have morals. Unlike these big CEOs, they're only concerned about one thing and one thing only. How much money can we make? They don't care about people suffering or dying from disease or death. Ethical concerns as big tobacco hustles in the health care. Philip Morris International is buying a successful British company making inhaled treatments for lung disease. They're talking about Victura and their purchasing of that. 
finally catching around to what's going on around them. So now they're going to pull out the ethical card and say, oh, well, it's unethical for them to make somebody sick and then sell them the treatment to them making them sick. You know, it's kind of like the Dr. Seuss story with the cartoon of them going around in a figure eight, an infinite circle. That's what they'd like to have because that's their big cash crop. They're the man standing in the middle making all the money. Well, you and I both know what's going on here. It's a big corporation. They're not going away. They know the people are quitting smoking. They know that they're not going to be able to keep selling them cigarettes, even though they're going to be selling them the heat, not burn sticks, which are healthier than combustible tobacco. However, they know that they're not going to be able to make as much money as they used to in the past. So let's get into the pharmaceutical aspect of things so we can make them sick and then treat them with the diseases that we caused. Sure. Moving on. Vapors told to head to the doctor ahead of the new import rules. If you're living in Australia and you caught on to this vaping news report and you don't know that you're going to need a prescription to be able to put nicotine into your e-liquids and your vapes, you need to get to your doctor and get a prescription because the fines are absolutely ridiculous. Purchase of nicotine vaping products from other Australian sources is already not permitted and will remain illegal. So even if you get a script, you're still not going to be able to buy it, except from a pharmacy. Yeah. And when you import it, you have to send a copy of your script to the person that you bought it from because that script has to be put into the package where your nicotine is in. Because when Border Customs grabs that package and opens it up and they find nicotine in there and it doesn't have a script for you, the customer, they're just gonna destroy it. And then they'll get a hold of you and say, we found one of your packages. And why are they doing that? Because they're gonna wanna see a copy of that script, even though they already destroyed your nicotine. But they're gonna wanna see a copy of that script because the fines for violation, if you're a business, are up to $11 million for importing vapes with nicotine. Mm -hmm. Or if the ingredients in your juice contain cinnamonaldehyde, yeah, which is used to create the cinnamon flavor, and acetonin, which is used to create the creamy flavor, but it's been associated with serious lung disease. It doesn't matter if the level of the acetonin in the juice is one-tenth of one-hundredth of one-thousandths percent of what's actually capable of causing damage. Just the fact that it's in there for these simpletons, it's gonna be reason for them to grab your stuff and destroy it, confiscate it, and then charge you with trying to hurt people. Meanwhile, every corner store and every dairy in Australia is freely allowed to sell cigarettes which contain those ingredients and kill people every single day. But that's perfectly fine. Sure, makes total sense. Not what you're expecting today, is it? Sorry, but I just simply didn't have the time to dedicate 20 some hours to create a vaping news report that the world can consume, but they'd choose not to. It's only us advocates that are worried about the government regulations taking away our right to vape while you're here watching this. So I'm sorry, but you're getting it raw today. Vape rules toughen up. Mm -hmm. You know where this is happening? The pinnacle of harm reduction in New Zealand. 
their laws are going into effect in the very near future. New rules are coming for vaping and smokeless tobacco products. Mm hmm. Associate Minister of Health, Dr. Ayesha Varal, says they cover packaging, product safety, and the responsibilities of manufacturers and the importers to help reduce the attractiveness and the appeal of vaping products to young people. Cartoons and toys on the packaging are banned. Only specialist vape retailers will be able to sell flavors other than tobacco, mint, and menthol. From November 28th, vaping and smoking in motor vehicles carrying children is completely banned. Dr. Varal says smoke-free enforcement officers have powers, including to enter and inspect premises, inspect advertising and vaping products for sale, and take air samples, photographs, or other recordings to be used in court. Mm -hmm. She says that there will be focus on ensuring protection for children and young people, and those are effective immediately, and they're being enforced. So I looked a little bit further into this. New e-cigarette bill comes into effect in New Zealand. Takes a step forward towards a smoke-free society. Sounds good, right? Are they doing anything about the actual cigarettes? That cause the combustion and the smoke? Or are they focusing on harm reduction products that don't have combustion, don't produce any smoke, is a gateway for people that smoke to get away from combustion and away from smoke. Well, they say that they're supporting it, or at least she does. But we'll get to that in a minute. What are they doing in New Zealand? For those of you that haven't been watching the news and you just happen to be here the first time watching this crazy man yell and scream. Well... What they're doing is they're removing all vaping products from every location for sale except specialty vape stores. I've got to put an edit in. Sorry. Okay, I'm back. Sorry, had to take care of something there. Might as well have a vape while I'm doing this. E-cigarette stores have expressed support for the legislation and are prepared to deal with the influx of young customers that they're going to be turning away. Because, see, what they're doing here is they're banning all vaping products from sale from every location except for specialty stores. But they're not touching cigarettes. Not yet. That's coming up in a minute. What she said about that. New uh, e-cigarette bill will be taking effect and uh, will be more difficult for New Zealand teenagers to obtain nicotine products. Yeah? You think so? Do you actually think that it's going to stop the teenagers from getting access to it? We've already covered on this channel about how teenagers are getting these products when they're in a situation where it's banned or they've tried to make the purchase and people have actually enforced the law that prevents them from having access to it already without all these new additional ridiculous regulations and requirements. So, here we go. They're moving it all away from every place except for a specialty vape store. Theoretically, this isn't something that, you know, anybody should be getting upset over, right? Well... It's time somebody does get upset over this because I personally think as a consumer, I don't own a store. I don't own a manufacturer of any of these products. I am a consumer of these products and I'm tired of restricting my access to these products because of kids that are already breaking the law. It's already illegal for these kids to have access to these products. And you think by making it more difficult for adults to have these products, the kids aren't going to get them. That's just ignorant to believe that that's actually going to happen. For some retailers, the new bill gives them a sigh of relief. Really? 
If you were a business that gives you a sigh of relief, don't carry the product. Nobody told you you had to carry the product. That's what this, this all boils down to. PJ runs a small shop near a high school, and he said that nearly 20 teenagers entered the store every week to buy an e-cigarette. They will try peach ice and watermelon flavor. These are very popular. Well, then don't sell them. Don't sell them to the kids. You're here complaining about kids are coming in and you're selling it to them? You just admitted that you are selling these products to these kids. If you don't want these kids to have them, don't carry them in your store. Why is this common sense so hard for people to understand? Oh, well, maybe because it isn't an actual real person that they're talking about in the story. Is This is just some propaganda that's being shoved down your throat as a consumer of this magazine's articles. That can't possibly be. Why are you so cynical? Maybe because I've seen it thousands upon thousands of times. I've been doing this news report for over a year, and it turns my stomach every time I come across these things, which is obvious propaganda and not really the way things are. Now, let's look at actual true news. Now, the source, News Hub, I don't know anything about News Hub to be honest with you. However, they actually have the full interview with the health minister, which I watched, obviously. Like I watch every week, tons of content that I have to narrow down and whittle down so that you guys have your limited news report of just 20 stories in 30 minutes. Well, this week we still got the same number of news stories. But it's not going to be twenty, not going to be thirty minutes because I'm not editing this other than making the cut I need to make for in a situation like what just happened. Otherwise, you're getting it raw and unfiltered. From August 11th, retailers such as dairy service stations and supermarkets will be banned from selling vaping products in flavors other than tobacco, mint, and menthol. Only specialized vape retailers will be able to sell other flavors. And from November 28th on, vaping and smoking in vehicles carrying children is also banned. Okay. Basically, I'm looking at the situation in the way of the general public and population and based upon the fact that most people do not have a favorable impression of vaping because of all the misinformation that's already been thrown out there. However, after doing this for a full year, I have read countless scientific studies showing what harms actually do exist in the vapor that comes out of these devices. And it pisses me off because see, I was a DJ until COVID set, shut that business down for me. And frequently for parties and events and celebrations, people would want fog machines there. Either the kind that fills up the floor with the fog that's low lying or the fog that fills up the entire room. And most of the time when money's not an issue for people, they want the scented fog so they could smell strawberries or any of the other options that are available in this room during their celebration. And I know firsthand, because I like to do things on the cheap when possible, that the exact same ingredients that go into these personal fog machines, which is a more accurate term than vaping, is the exact same ingredients that go into the big fog machines, the industrial stage fog machines that I use for these performances and these events. But nobody has a problem with any of that. As soon as you put it into a handheld personal device, well, the first question that somebody that doesn't have bias towards vaping is, oh, congratulations, I see you quit smoking. Mm-hmm. 
that's just a minority of the people. The rest of the people give you funny looks because they're like, oh, you're contributing to my teenager wanting to vape. Oh, yeah? That's another cigarette I didn't smoke. So how about you give me a little self-worth and acknowledge the fact that there are millions upon millions of people like me that could benefit from this technology. It's no different than the fog machine you ordered last week for your birthday event. But you want to be stupid and not realize that this is the exact same thing as that. Moving on. Getting back to the real news. I told you this is going to be unfiltered. Normally, I have these conversations in my head because I'm sitting there reading this and just thinking to myself, oh, these people are morons. They really don't understand this technology and how simple it is. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to, rocket scientist to figure this out. There are literally four components to vape liquid. Propylene glycol, which is used by the pharmaceutical industry, and the healthcare industry in countless medications as a drug solubilizer. Vegetable glycerin, which is naturally occurring. And in most of the foods, the processed foods that we eat every day. But I'm not supposed to get upset about that. People are saying those ingredients are what's hurting people. Propylene glycol is antifreeze. Yeah? but it's not ethylene glycol. That's why they're used in RV antifreezes. So it doesn't hurt people or the environment. But now all of a sudden, if you use it in this device, oh, now we're hurting the environment? Oh, really? The most polluted substance on the planet is cigarette butts. But that's okay. We ignore that because they're just a trashy smoker that we've written off of society as a fourth-class citizen. So when you go and pick up a vape, no, you're just a third-class citizen. So we don't want to hear what you have to say either. But we're going to be polite about it. I'm going to calm down. Because I know you guys don't want to sit here and watch a guy yell and scream for an hour. All right, so let's get back to the story here. It's crazy that Kiwis desperate to quit cigarettes can walk into a service station and buy any brand of cigarette under the sun. They can't, however, access the most popular vape flavors. Says Jonathan DeVry, co-owner of vape companies, Alt New Zealand and Vapo. Ex-smoker DeVry, another vape shop owner who's an ex-smoker. No surprise there. You find something that gives you the power to give up the worst addiction you never thought you would ever have, cigarette smoking, and you want to be able to empower other people to do the same thing, especially after you've tried all of the pharmaceutical products out there that are all crap. They're making money every time you buy it and fail. And go back to smoking. Then you go to the doctor. It's another round robin situation. You go to the doctor. Oh, no, you need to quit. Well, what would you try so far? Oh, yeah, well, well, let's try this one. Another pharmaceutical product that doesn't work. But here, try it. Try it. And only after you've exhausted all of these things and made the pharmaceutical company all this money and made the tobacco industry all this money, then... They'll let you try a vape. I want you to try the most successful, best way to quit smoking on the planet. Oh, because then it infringes on their ability to make profit. Mm. It infuriates me to no end what's going on in this world. The hypocrisy that I see every single day. Elected officials. Ugh. It's crazy. 
after achieving record low smoking rates, a return to cigarette smoking would be an absolute disaster. But that's exactly what you see everywhere that they ban these products. San Francisco banned these products, right? So what did you see? An increase in smoking rates, not just in adults, but also the teenagers. Mm -hmm. Tell me how this policy changes are good for public health when it drives people back to combustible tobacco. It isn't. Tobacco tax takings have been completely walloped by vaping. That's what it boils down to in a lot of these governments and a lot of these elected officials. We don't have any money to spend. So let's institute policies that drive people back to smoking so we can get some of this tobacco tax revenue. Even though people want to quit smoking. Most people do. Not everybody. We talked about that too. There's plenty of science on that too. 30% of smokers will never quit. They'll die with a cigarette in their mouth if you let them. And if you don't let them, they're still going to do it. They don't care if it's banned or not. Tobacco tax revenue fell by almost $700 million. Treasury documents showed in March the drop was steeper than expected with the government collecting $400 million or 28.9% less than was forecasted in December's half-year economic and fiscal update. Mm-hmm. Unlike cigarette retailers, specialist vape stores will have to be registered. Another cost and another fee for the store that's going to sell you the product that can actually get you to quit smoking if you really want to. With fewer dedicated vape stores in the likes of the rural areas, DeVry believes many Kiwis trying to reduce or quit their cigarette habit will only find it harder. Of course they will, because you can't have access to it. That's the big problem up in Canada. It's a problem here in the United States too, except most people don't want to admit it or think about the fact. Population density varies. And in some places of the country, you literally have to drive 300 miles to access a harm reduction product here in the United States and in Canada. But in there, they're talking about kilometers. So is it right to force people to drive 300 miles up to 300 miles to access harm reduction, but they can go into any local gas station, grocery store, convenience store, super box store, and access the full harm product. Tell me how that makes any sense. Can you? I'd love to hear somebody tell me that they can because I'll call them a liar right to their face. Doesn't make any sense. I don't care if this product was 1% safer than combustible tobacco. It should be available everywhere. Period and discussion. If anything, the government should subsidize vaping to make it cheaper than cigarettes, even though it already is because of the simple ingredients that are involved in it. We talked about earlier, have propylene glycol, vegetable glycerin, and then you have flavorings that usually make up 10, at most 15% of the solution of that bottle. And then for those that need to quit smoking, you have nicotine in the bottle that lets the user Choose when they're ready to step down, if they want to step down. And they don't have to be ready to step down. They could stay on nicotine the rest of their life and still be healthier for them. You don't have a problem with people going and getting coffee, do you? Caffeine has the same addictive power as nicotine. It also has the same harms. High concentration, high dose caffeine can kill you. And you do the same thing with nicotine, ultra high concentration doses. They have the potential to kill people if the dose is high enough. But in the doses that we find in the standard bottles of e-liquid for vaping, three milligrams, six milligram, 12 milligram, 
It's not a problem. And some people won't even notice it. If you smoke like I did, three packs a day, that is nothing. In order for me to quit smoking, I use six milligrams. But I chain vaped that all day long, every single day for three days before I was totally free and clear of my constant desire to light up a cigarette. Three days. Now, if I would have used a 5% solution, which is 50 milligrams per milliliter, I probably could have equally substituted out every cigarette I would have had with a puff from one of them inhalers or Juul product or whatever device it is. This is no different than a vehicle, but people have a problem with it. They can't go after the actual ingredients because they don't harm you and you don't hardly consume any of it. So even if there is something in it that does harm you, it's such a minuscule part of it that you have that. Let's say that there was some of that acetoin in this or that cinnamon flavor component that's in it. You know how many drops of that would go into this? A couple. And this bottle lasts the average vapor over a week or up to a week. Yeah. So where's the damage? Where's the harm? There isn't any. Common sense will tell you. Any dangerous drug is only dangerous because of the dosage. If you took any pill, let's say even fentanyl, and you only gave them a microgram of a pill, would that hurt the person? No. And anybody that has any common sense and has any experience in any type of healthcare industry job will tell you the dangers in the dosage. When people swallow whole bottles of pills, that's when they have problems. You could double the pills, most drugs, and you won't see any significant effects from it. And there's some medications out there. Perfect examples, aspirin. Aspirin has a different effect on the body depending on the dosage. You take it in low dose, like you're supposed to do when you have a heart attack. Okay. And it has a different effect than when you take it at a higher dosage. 81 milligrams is different effect on the body than 325 milligrams of aspirin. The damage is in the dosage. But nobody wants to deal with any of that. Because that's too complicated for them to actually have to use a brain cell and think about it. Sorry. I know you didn't come here for a rant. And if anything I ever say is wrong, please leave a comment and tell me about it. I'd like to have real conversations with people. Most people won't engage once they realize that you have the intelligence and the research and the background to understand what you're talking about. That's the situation here. We have them starting to understand the situation and understand that they do want to have a smoke-free goal. And while I applaud and laud them for that, it's never going to happen. Because 30% of smokers refuse to quit. No matter what you do, they will find a way. They're no different than most people's picture of a heroin addict. They will find a way no matter what until it kills them. I'm not opposed to it. I'm just saying that let's keep things real. All right? Tobacco tax takings have dipped and dived and they fell and they know it's falling and it's no, they know it's going to continue to fall because if their goal is to have a smoke-free society, then their goal also has to be to replace all of this blood money that they've been sucking out of tobacco with another form of income because they know that if they reach their goal, all that will be completely gone. That's why you see organizations and governments taxing the heck out of this product. You want to go ahead and use it recreationally, fine, but we're going to tax it. 
It's also a reason why a lot of these government organizations are now legalizing cannabis. Because they only care about money. They don't care about people's health. I know a cannabis user that was bragging about how, oh, they're finally believing all the science from all these years. No, they're not. They're only, they're only interested in your wallet. They want to tax the product that you're going to go out and buy. It's been illegal your entire life, and you've bought it. Bans and prohibition doesn't actually work. It just creates a black market. Crime syndicates. That's the reality of economics. Simple, fundamental economics. All right, all right, all right. I beat the horse dead here, beyond dead. I will be leaving links to all these stories in the description below if you want to check them out for yourself. You can listen to her actual interview. She does admit the fact that New Zealand knows the tax increases on cigarettes have reached the point where they're higher than any benefit's going to do. So continuing to raise that will only grow a black market. So in New Zealand, they're not going to raise the taxes on cigarettes anymore. Their focus is on making things more attractive. The one reporter even asked her, what do you think about taking the tobacco tax revenue that you have and using it to pay for advertising to promote vaping as a way to quit smoking? And she says, well, you have to go talk to the finance minister about that because the tobacco tax money isn't actually spent on tobacco or health care for tobacco illnesses. Well, why is that? Well, you're going to have to talk to the finance minister about that because... As a doctor, she would love to have more money to promote vaping to quit smoking. But she doesn't think that she needs to because she thinks it already has an effective... I think she's trying to prevent other people from looking bad. Another issue that comes into politics once you're in there. You don't want to piss the wrong person off and find yourself quickly out of a job. Anyway, moving on. My apologies. I, I know you don't want to hear me rant and rave like this. Maybe you do. I don't know. It was back in July when I reported about this. Vape shops are frustrated beyond belief because what happens when you continually raise the prices on these tobacco products, people turn to the black market. And then when they go to the black market and they find out how much the black market is charging for those products, they go, I can't afford that, but I still want my stuff. So they have people turning to crime to fund their addiction. It's an economic reality all around the world, regardless of the topic of conversation. I don't care whether you're talking about tobacco products. I don't care if you're talking about re restricted or prohibited drugs. I don't care what it is you're talking about. If people want the product and they can't afford it, they're going to find a way to afford it. And when people are already working 60, 80 hours a week just to make ends meet and surviving on two meals a day and still falling behind on their bills sometimes, well, they're going to turn to crime to fund their life because that's what it boils down to. Living within your means and then facing reality. Well, here's what happened. They put the vape mail ban into effect. Now you got a rash of break-ins. Just like you'll see in a minute, this isn't just happening in the United States. They ban these things left and right. You got a rash of break-ins. Happens also in Australia, where the price is already astronomically high. And every year, they keep trying to jack it up even higher. It's going to be pretty soon. A single pack of cigarettes is going to cost $100 or $150 or $500. Whatever it takes to get people to stop. More like whatever it takes to fill the government's coffers with tax money that they can spend on everything except for what they're supposed to be spending it on. However, back on topic, I reported back in July, 
that uh, Cloud9 and three other vape shops were broken into in a rash of break-ins. Well, they caught the guy. There he is right there. A 20-year-old Lincoln man was sentenced to five to ten years in prison in connection with a string of break-ins at smoke shops in February 2020. Police arrested Tang Lian on June 10th, 2020, for allegedly being a lookout during the burglaries. The remaining suspects are still at large. Police said that the glass case was broken and vaping products taken totaled $1,600 at DNK, and the burglary at Cloud9 involved an estimated $60,000 damage to display cases and products. They literally went in there and smashed the heck out of everything to get access to it. You don't have a key. It's the only way to get into the case. Well, this guy, who's just a lookout, was caught and is now prosecuted. In Tulsa, Oklahoma, three, three suspects broke into the smoke shop to steal a bunch of stuff. I uh, didn't dig into this one as far, as far as I did the last one. However, there's a nice video here. Here's the store worker, and then we have his girlfriend standing behind him and if we play this just for a brief second you'll see he goes to put the people out of the store tells them they gotta leave well this guy took a couple steps and decided he wasn't going to leave he wasn't going to leave without coming out of the store with something that he obviously went in there to get so he starts fighting with the guy his uh, girlfriend ends up going to call 911 and then his buddies come back in, have an altercation with him, knock over some stands, cause some damage, and end up fleeing with the products that they originally came there to get. Well, they caught him too. You know, that's one thing that happens when you start banning things left and right, and you get these crime waves. It increases activity for the local police departments. Makes them look good. Gives them a reason to have a job, too. And it makes money for the prison industrial complex, too. But the rash of crimes will continue as long as these products are not affordable or prohibited. Here we have a 24-year-old Fletcher man who said he had uh, $40 in cash and $30 bottle of vaping juice missing from his Ford EcoSport because there was a rash of crimes. This is something that's happened right around where we live too. Two, three, four o'clock in the morning, these kids are wandering the streets, checking for unlocked cars and then rummaging through them to get even pocket change if that's all they can get, whatever they can get to fund their habit, to fund their addiction, whatever it is. How much of this would be going on if the system was legalized? If you had to go to a social worker, let's just say, I think it was Portugal that did something like this. I don't know. I'm not going to say off the top of my head without having the facts to back it up. However, there is a country that did this and legalized it. Legalized everything. No matter what you wanted, you could have it. However, if you wanted to have it, you had to go see a social worker. Tell them what you want. Prove that you have a stable life, a stable occupation, and the funds necessary to supply your desired addiction for these products. And then they would sell them those products, obviously taxed at a reasonable rate. And this country that did this took the funding from this and paid for all the people in the country to have health care. So, we can continue doing things the way that we have been doing, and it doesn't work, or perhaps it's time that we tried something different. This is one way to do it. And interestingly enough, when that country legalized all the drugs that were out there, implemented this, the crime waves disappeared for the most part. 
didn't make it all the way go away. Nobody really thought that, that was going to happen. But the majority of it that was committed by these people, because it was the only reason they were breaking in, well, that went away. Basic economics. Well, here we go. New Zealand. Spike in dairy robberies linked to tobacco tax hike, research shows. It's common sense. I don't understand how people cannot understand this. I mean, I know we got plenty of blockheads out there that think they know everything about everything and, and only care about things in their perspective. You know, you can label them whatever you want to label them. You know, doesn't matter what political affiliation they have. You can label people however you want to label them. People are narrow-minded, generally speaking. And when they're narrow-minded and they refuse to see what's going on around them, they only believe what they want to believe. Facts only get you so far. It's the reason why the war on vaping isn't progressing. Because no matter how many scientific studies you prove, the only thing that those scientific studies are good for is when you are talking about things in open public, when the government's trying to implement laws. The public doesn't give a shit about science, generally speaking. Sure, if you came out with a cure for cancer, they might be interested in it. But most people don't even care about cancer. If they did, they'd find out the shenanigans going on in that industry as well. Why do I talk about that? The vaping? Because the pugnants say the vaping causes cancer. Vaping would eliminate 99.5% of the cancer that tobacco causes. But they don't want to admit that. Science is done in England on this. Has been done for decades by the government since the government has to pay for the health care of the people. As tobacco became increasingly unaffordable, it was stolen for personal use or to supply the black market. We talked about this before. Nice to see it getting some press. Well, maybe it's not so much that it's getting some press as it's becoming a bigger problem the higher the taxes go. And maybe that's the reason why the health minister said no more tax increases. We've taxed it already. It's already reached its maximum effect. Any higher taxation like Australia would be counterproductive because it would cause more problems than the ones that we're trying to solve. Owners of dairies and service stations welcome the new tobacco robbery study. If we're not going to fix the problem, we're going to assign somebody to study it because that's always a solution by a politician. Oh, we'll look into that. Or, we're going to fix that. If we need to look into it, I'm going to get a study done about it. You already understand the problem. You already have the power and the resources to do something about it. You choose not to. That's what it all boils down to. It's not financially beneficial for you or one of your supporters, so you're not going to support it or even talk about it half the time. Hundreds of dairy and service station owners will agree with the study led by Dr. Marewa Glover that there is a link between hikes in tobacco excise taxes and the robberies. Current government has realized that you can't keep getting $2 billion worth of excise blood from the smoking stone and has stopped further tobacco tax excise tax hikes. Let me say that again. Has stopped further tobacco excise tax hikes. Hiking taxes year after year is not the solution to deter people from smoking. In fact, it's done huge damage. We talked about this before. It's common sense. You raise the price artificially high. It's the next thing that's going to happen. A leads to B, leads to C, leads to D. We've already known about it. Now you're actually starting to see it. And the more that they ban it, the more that they're going to see these consequences. 
Well, I thought I'd change the pace up a little bit for you guys. So, <clears throat> there's always going to be some new thing out there, some new psychedelic, some new drug, something that's going to keep people entertained. Well, what are celebrities doing now? Cocaine's a thing of the past. Marijuana's league getting legalized, so let's. What's the point in doing that anymore? Vaping's got a bad name, so unless you're using it to quit smoking, meh, not interesting anymore. So what are they doing? Celebrities are smoking toad venom. The trendy and potent psychedelic drug actually has some pretty impressive mental health benefits. Wow. Who would have ever thought I'd see the day where cannabis is legalized. Harm reduction products to get people to quit smoking would be banned. And people would turn to things like toad venom to entertain themselves as the new fashionista way of being social. There'll be a link in the description below if you want to check this out came across it because not only are they smoking toad venom they're also putting it in a vape wonder what kind of health effects that has although i suppose if it's not oil based it doesn't cause lipoid pneumonia won't be confused for a volley cases percentage of americans who smoke near record low poll finds here we are usnews.com published this article percentage of americans who smoke cigarettes stands near its lowest point on record a new gallup survey found the poll found 16 percent of american adults reported smoking any cigarette in the past week the most recent reading is nearly statistically the same as the record low 15 percent of americans who reported Smoking any cigarettes in 2019. In other words, it continues on its stagnant rate downward. More like, since all the vaping was attacked, it went from 15% to 16%. But we're going to call that statistically insignificant. When I was growing up, according to the U.S. government, 56% of people smoked. Now we're down to 15%. I think that's progress. Then again, when I started smoking, a pack of cigarettes was less than a buck. When I quit smoking, it was like eight bucks a pack. Except if you were in New York, it's like $12 a pack. But New York has a much bigger black market than Pennsylvania or Ohio. E-cigarettes are not our enemy. This article, once again, reinforces what we already know. However, Spiked Online is talking about in England. Because see, as time goes on, politics changes things, changes the people that are ahead of organizations and representing organizations. Since over the past few years, the Department of Health and Social Care has become fizzing hub of nanny statism. Matt Hancock was recently caught with his knickers up a flagpole and forced to resign as health secretary. But his successor, Sajid Javid, wants to keep Hancock's legacy alive making our lifestyle choices for us through patronizing public health interventions. Mm -hmm. We talked about this last week. Rumor going around that they were going to adopt Tobacco 21 in the UK. He's reportedly considering the sale of e-cigarettes to adults over the age of 21 only. Putting aside the government's haughtiness in treating us like children... 
trying to wean us off cigarettes, a crackdown on vaping is bound to backfire. Vaping is genuinely a silver bullet, and it is the only, the one and only route to a smoke-free England. Vaping is a very effective method to help smokers to quit. More than half of the UK vapers are ex-smokers. Roughly 1.7 million people in the UK have used vaping to quit smoking. Once ex-smokers switch to e-cigarettes, they are much better off for it. Vaping is estimated to be 95% less harmful than ordinary cigarettes and drastically less likely to give you cancer. Everyone else is better off too because e-cigarettes produce no secondhand smoke. Secondhand vapor poses a negligible health risk. Well, it depends on where you live. If you live in the city and you breathe in the noxious gases from that concentration of vehicles in the city with stagnant air, I'd be willing to bet you could find a city where it, the air that you breathe in, would be more hazardous to your health than the air that comes out of this. The public health lobby's hatred for vaping is deranged and nonsensical. Banning vapes is like trying to prevent car crashes by banning brakes. And yet, the World Health Organization consistently pressures policymakers around the world to adopt this actively harmful stance. He says that our government is becoming more susceptible to this day by day. If vaping is for unfathomable reasons no longer part of the government's arsenal in its war against cigarettes, what other tricks do they have up their sleeve? Do you know? There is no other trick up the sleeve. I've tried all the previous methods that have been out there. Didn't work. Made the situation worse most of the time, to be honest with you. Because it was like it's like going on a diet. We've all been on a diet before in our lives, right? You realize you're heavier than you want to be. So you hear about this latest diet fad that's going around. Oh, I gotta try that. That'll that'll help. It's helping all my friends. They're they're doing it. So you try it. Diets don't work. If you want to change the way you eat and lose weight, then you need to change your lifestyle, not just go on a diet, thinking that you can go back to the way it was. And the problem isn't going to come back. Common sense. It's like quitting smoking. Quitting smoking only works because you want to quit smoking. If I were to take this and say, I'm done, I'm going to light up a cigarette just to be social with my friends, I'd be back to fucking smoking and back to square one. It's a choice that people have to make and then stick with for the rest of their life. It's not a light switch you can turn on and off when you feel like it. Anyway, there's going to be a link in the description below if you want to check this out. Moving on. More from the UK. Same basic argument, same basic statement, same basic situation. Banning vape sales will do more harm than good. It was recently revealed that Sajid Javid, still fresh-faced at his new job as health secretary, is set to launch the next stage in the government's plan to make England smoke-free by 2030. With focus on cracking down on younger smokers, the headline propose, the headline proposal is banning sales of e-cigarettes to under 21s in the hope that 18 to 21 year olds will no longer be able to vape. Mm hmm. Once again, ignoring common sense, common sense would tell you this is the harm free, harmless, not harmless, harm reduction product. Therefore, if you're going to do anything, focus on the product that's actually causing the harm. And that's what the health minister in New Zealand is talking about doing. 
They're talking about changing the legal age at which you can purchase tobacco for combustion. So the idea is this year will be the last year that somebody is of 18 years of age can purchase tobacco products for combustion. Next year, that age will be 19. Then the year after that, it'll be 20. And then the year after that, it'll be 21. And this will continue on until it is completely banned. And this process may take 10, 20, 30, or 40 years before combustible tobacco will no longer be for sale or available legally. However, to do the same thing with the harm reduction product, it's counterintuitive and counterproductive because you're always going to have somebody that's breaking the law. If they have to get it on the black market, they'll get it on the black market. So does it make any sense for you to ban them both? Make this product legal for anybody over the age of 18 or whatever the age of maturation is in your country. Canada, they consider it 19. Some places it's 18. Some places it's 16 in the world. Some places it's 21 in the world. It all depends on where you live and what your social norms are for the age of maturation. Some places it's 14, which I think is preposterous, but whatever. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion and their own social evolution. Point being, vaping is consistently shown to be the most effective way to quit smoking. So let them have their vapes. It's that simple. If it only causes 5% of the harm that tobacco smoking does, it's a win for society. Let this go on until you deal with and win the first war. And then come revisit this in 10 or 15 years if you want to worry about eliminating vaping. Eliminate combustion first. And then worry about all this other stuff. No, they're going to focus on the off-ramp from the tobacco highway so they can keep getting and milking these people for their tax money. There'll be a link in the description below if you want to check this one out. I just never thought I'd see the day when this conversation would be taking place in the UK. Boggles the mind almost as much as this video. Quacko uh, forced to smoke e-cigarette and disturbing online video. You know, never ceases to amaze me the stupidity that we deal with in this world. Here we go. It isn't bad enough to have to hear about teenagers vaping. Here we go. We have a teenager who's vaping and now giving it to a koala. Koala. Call him Kwanka. My apologies. I'm usually pretty good about the uh, way that these uh, people call different things to different countries and whatnot. This one's caught me off guard. Koala. They call him Kwanka. Seems to think it be given food as the young girl appears to force the purple vape pen down its throat in the video. Now, I'm not even going to give this any credence. There'll be a link in the description if you actually want to check it out. I just thought it was disgusting. That doesn't even qualify as a public service announcement. Moving on. Because here we have the dominoes continuing to fall all around the globe as Bloomberg's propaganda money infiltrate countries that we didn't even know were in play. Ukraine folds to the World Health Organization to stop aromas in electronic cigarettes. Flavor ban in the UK to appease the World Health Organization. You know, the parliament has in fact approved the new law on tobacco, providing among other things, the ban on the production or sale of flavored liquids for electronic cigarettes. That is, only tobacco flavors will be allowed. You know, if these people actually knew anything about vaping, they would know there is no such thing as tobacco flavor for vaping. 
It is not natural for vegetable glycerin and propylene glycol to taste like tobacco because it's not a derivative of tobacco. Never was meant to be. But simple-minded people and these little simpleton politicians think that, well, we'll just make it the same as combustible tobacco. That'll make it easier for somebody that's on tobacco to quit. Wrong. All it does is remind them that would be like having a non-alcoholic drink only non-alcoholic beer the rest of his life. No pop, no soda, no juice, nothing. If you're an alcoholic, you're limited to only drinking alcoholic flavors. How long do you think that's going to keep that guy away from the real thing? Where is common sense in this world anymore? Where is it gone? Why can't people understand basic logic? Or people too worried about themselves to care. Coming from Malaysia, from Kuala Lumpur. Tobacco harm reduction already successful in reducing smoking in many countries. You and I all know this. We know this. Leading experts in the field of science technology as well as policy and consumer advocacy believe that harm reduction can play an important role in improving health. It is required to improve public health. People will do what they want to do. People don't really care about public health. There's a lot of people who don't even care about their own health. They're only worried about living in the moment. What's good for me today, right now, that's all that really matters to me. Well, until you all get over the hill, then you come to realize you're not invincible and you're not going to live forever. So if you want to keep enjoying life, maybe you need to change some things and take things into consideration that you wouldn't have otherwise considered or cared about because you want to stick around a little longer. It's an eventuality for most people. There'll be a link in the description below. This is stuff that we've already talked about. But reducing smoking is an important public health issue and government needs to consider how harm reduction strategies can help it achieve its goal of lowering the country's smoking prevalence. They're talking about Malaysia, but this conversation is taking place all around the world. If you think your country isn't involved in a conversation about this, you're highly mistaken. Another article coming from the UK, smoking bans don't work, nor will cracking down on vape and cigarette sales. Three articles this week talking about this. And to my knowledge, the UK isn't actually considering any of this prohibitionist mentality stuff. I understand they're in, the pro they're in the process of Brexit and creating their own regulatory framework, formalizing it. So I understand that there are people poking the stick to get them to change and adopt World Health Organization frameworks on this and that. But realistically, why is it that there's more advocacy coming out of the UK and New Zealand than I see around the rest of the world? I have a hard time believing that there's that many people who just don't care about it in this country. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm, maybe the people in this country are only worried about themselves and their own social circle and their own circumstances and are fine with being oblivious to what's going on elsewhere. But while I do appreciate being able to read this kind of stuff in in the back of my mind it's it's worrying some because it's like do they know something that i don't know about is there something coming down the road that none of us ex ever expected a crackdown of vaping in the uk that's unimaginable the uk has proven the science behind it They've proven how effective it is to quit smoking. If you know something that I don't, leave a comment in the description below. I'm going to move on. 
Banning 70% of vape products, they're talking about flavor bans, will only help government coffers. Published in Vape Hong Kong, they're actually talking about New Zealand and the changes that we talked about earlier in New Zealand, where it's a flavor ban everywhere except for vape shops. Vape shops are allowed to sell whatever the flavors are, so long as it doesn't have any bad components in it. Everybody else is going to be limited to mint, menthol, and tobacco flavor. But they can sell you any kind of tobacco, any brand of tobacco that's out there for combustion. Anywhere. But if you want a harm reduction product, you're limited to mint, menthol, and tobacco. So that we can protect the youth. Because they think that youth won't be able to access these products. That's not how the black market works, people. Anyway, link in the description below if you want to check it out. Moving on to Poland. World Health Organization poking the stick of Poland saying, your tobacco tax excise fees are too low. You need to raise them up. So here comes the propaganda to promote it talking about how doctors in Poland are concerned about the return of the cigarette smoking trend among young people. Hmm. You poison the harm reduction pill of vaping. What do you think the kids are going to do? Common sense will tell you. They're going to go and try it. Except when you try a cigarette, it's not as easy to give up as trying to vape. That's scientifically proven truth. But they ignore that. In order for them to raise the taxes again, talking about the black market and talking about how Polish, Poland has the lowest excise tax for tobacco. So we need to increase it. And it'll make up for budget losses that we weren't anticipating because of COVID. Yeah, okay. Here we go. Another article from Poland. Trumpeting this lovely, have you guys, we'll cover that in a minute. Level of oxidative stress. A study done. California. UCLA. Bunch of boneheads. Vaping can cause damage to the lungs. E-cigarettes increase the level of oxidative stress. This is published in Poland. Right? So let's go to the horse's mouth, shall we? Or at least get a little closer. Vaping poses an unambiguous and worrying risk for non-smokers. According to a study, vaping has indisputable harmful effects on non-smokers by increasing their oxidative stress. Yeah? Recent study from the University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA, recently reported... Yeah, clear and unambiguous and worrying risks. What? Is that the horse's mouth saying? Mm-hmm. Let's take a look at the actual research, right? Published in JAMA Network, JAMA Pediatrics. Association of one vaping session with cellular oxidative stress in otherwise healthy young people with no history of smoking or vaping. Chip, that's not how science is done. How is the science actually done? Well, we get a group of people. And in order for us to talk about this part of the group, we need to have other groups to compare them to so that we can make a claim about this group. So what did this study do? Well, it took a group of people that smoke cigarettes. Then it took a group of people who used electronic cigarettes, and then it took a group of people that never did either. And they're going to use the people that didn't do either as the rats to experiment on. So they took the people that smoked, and they came in, they gave them a blood draw. Okay? Then they took the people that used electronic cigarettes, i.e. vaping, and then they took a people of people that have never touched either and made them vape. Well, half of them. Half of them got to vape using a 5% Juul-type device. 
With 50 milligram per milliliter concentration of nicotine, the other half of the group that never smoked and never vaped, I'm going to scroll down. You're going to love this one. All right, all right. I'm sorry. I know I said I wasn't going to cut this out today, but I really wanted to find this, and I didn't want you guys to sit here and have to wait for me to find this. This is what they were doing, okay? Here's the rat groups, the way they did them. You're going to love this. There was nine people who were long-term smokers. Meanwhile, this entire group of people that they studied was 21 to 33 years of age. The mean age was 24. 19 of them were men. Nine of them had long-term cigarette usage. 12 of them were long-term vapors. And 11 of them have never smoked and never vaped. So here's the population size. We're talking about 11 people. Now, out of these 11 people, they're going to have to have half of them be a control group that does not vape or smoke or anything. The other half of the 11 people are going to be vaping for the first time using 5% 5, 5 nicotine, 50 milligram nicotine. I was a three-pack-a-day smoker, and I guarantee you if I picked up a 5% nicotine vape, I would have serious nicotine buzz off of using that device. The way that they made them do that, 30 minute session. Vape this for 30 minutes. 5% nicotine. Mm hmm. And you know what they did to the control group? Now, remember, this whole thing was testing to see oxidative stress, meaning, how stressed out do you get? And then what's your body's reaction to that stress? That's what they're testing. What's your body's reaction to that stress? Okay. They're using what they call sham vaping. You know what sham vaping is? They gave them a straw. How good of a scientist are you if you are telling people you are the placebo? So you can just relax. No reason to worry because you have a straw. That's not a vape. And then they gave the other people a vape and made them use it. except they were using a jewel, so it didn't like cloud out the whole room like that. Did. But you get the point. If you were a non-smoker, non-vapor, and you went to this study to be their little guinea pig rat, and they handed you the vape, and you knew that you were going to be in the vape group because they handed you a vape, and you look right next to you, and the guy's given a straw. Like, obviously, the guy with the straw is going to be like, <laughs> yeah, okay, I'll breathe through the straw for half an hour. Meanwhile, the guy sitting next to him knows that he's the rat and knows that he's being experimented on, gets to use the vape for the first time in his entire life, and he's been given 50 milligram per milliliter. What a joke. And this is what all the hubbub is about in all these articles. Moving on to the other science article for this week. We're coming to the end, people. I'm sorry. I know this is taking a long time because it's not being edited, but here's some science for you. Reactions to sales restrictions on flavored vape products or all vape products among young adults in the U.S. So this is what they're spending their time on to determine what effect all this brainwashing has had on these young kids and these young adults. We're going to determine what they think about more restrictions and more bans. So let's take a look at the scientific study. This is a hoot. We analyzed February through May 2020 data from a longitudinal study of 2,159 young adults between the ages of 18 to 34. The mean is 24. 
Okay. Out of these 2,159 young adults, 550 have used a vape at least once in the last 30 days. How is that a representative sample? Number one, you want meaningful science, you have to have what's called a representative sample of the population that you're going to study. 2,159 young adults, 550 of them have tried a vape in the last 30 days. Okay. Six metropolitan areas is where they conducted this study at. Atlanta, Boston, Minneapolis, Oklahoma City, San Diego, and Seattle. Why am I talking about the actual cities that they did the study in? Because it matters when you're trying to determine what the representative sample is of a population group to determine what you can make and predict and factor into something scientifically worthy of your time to actually produce a study. Okay. Atlanta has a population of 5,911,000 people. Boston has a population of 4,314,000 people. Minneapolis has a population of 2,000, 2,000,000, million people. Oklahoma City is 998,000, almost a million people. San Diego is one and a half million people. And you have 2,159 young adults. How is that a representative sample? Is that is that statistically significant? Of course not. Not even close. But we're going to do this study and we're going to publish it and we're going to make hay about it and we're going to make press about it. Well, regardless of the fact that it does not produce a representative sample of anything, it is meaningful data and as long as you keep in mind the fact that it's not representative of anything in particular. 24.2% of e-cigarette users and 57.6% of non-users support, strongly or somewhat, sales restrictions on vape products. 24% of these users support restrictions on these products? Maybe the 24.2% that you're talking about don't actually use these products. Maybe they tried them, and that's why they got put into the 550 people group of past 30 day use. How is that meaningful? What is what? What are you actually getting accomplished here? 15.1% of e-cigarette users supported complete vape product sales restrictions. 15% of users want a complete ban of the product that they use. How on earth does anybody that uses any product want a ban of it? That would be like asking people that eat bananas in the last 30 days if they want the bananas to be banned. Where, where on earth would you get 15% of the population that ate a banana in the last 30 days want to have bananas banned? That is completely illogical and nonsensical. And you want us to believe the rest of your findings. That doesn't make any sense to me. 45% of non-people, non-banana eaters wanted it banned. And 15% of people that eat bananas want it, want it banned. What? Tell me you're not trying to accomplish a goal by publishing this study. Ridiculous. Moving on. Moving on to something real. Canada. Listen, if you live in Canada, you need to act now. You need to go and write your members of parliament and tell them to stop this ridiculous flavor ban that you guys have coming. It's not just New Zealand is going to be dealing with this. At least in New Zealand, you can go to a vape shop and get all your flavors. They're talking about completely banning flavors in Canada. It's horrible. My friend Maria is an enthusiastic vapor. If I go to her office, she usually have three vapes on the go. Today is a Vupu with strawberry flavor, a Silth with grape apple ice, and a Favost with banana flavor. 
we go to a restaurant, she will excuse herself between every course to go outside and vape. She vapes from early morning to late at night, every day. She keeps a spare vape at home just in case. Even if she is sick, she keeps on vaping. She would never even consider going on vacation to a country that did not allow her to vape. Some people would call her a nicotine addict, but she refutes that label. She says that she enjoys vaping and that it is not looking, not doing her or anyone else any harm. In fact, she says that she has had fewer respiratory illnesses since she switched from smoking and nicotine helps her concentrate. Well, maybe because that's already been studied and backed up as fact. And quite honestly, when they were talking about moving the nicotine replacement therapies from behind the pharmacy counter out to general sale for the public, there were plenty of studies that came out that confirmed that fact. As her friend and as her physician, I am pleased to see her vaping because for Maria, the only alternative to vaping is smoking cigarettes. She began with a John Player special at 14 and rapidly became a pack a day smoker. She tried to quit because she tried to quit, but was unable to do so. Nicotine patches gave her nightmares and she went manic on Zyban. She discovered vaping in 2010 and stopped smoking completely three weeks later. This article is written by John Oyston, an assistant professor at the University of Toronto and has been an advocate for tobacco control for many years. He's been funded by the University of Katina for research into health effects of vaping and Cerna paid him as a consultant on the curriculum development related to vaping. He runs a smoking cessation program called Quit by Vaping. So you understand where his perspective is and where he's coming from. But facts are facts and people are people. And I'm tired of the fact that my entire life I've been dismissed as a second class citizen because I was a smoker. And as time has gone on from moving from a second class citizen to a third class citizen because the war on tobacco has gotten that bad. I thought that I had finally overcome that when I quit smoking by picking up vaping because vaping is not smoking period. If I'm vaping, I am not smoking. It's that simple. So I thought, well, I'm not a smoker anymore, so I won't have to be stigmatized anymore or chastised for my choices in life. I thought, honestly, that if I was vaping, it would be no different than somebody seeing me drink a cup of coffee. Because I was not smoking. But that isn't what we find in the world today. Vapors are being chastised and told that they need to quit because you didn't quit smoking. You're still vaping. Vaping is not smoking, but they don't understand that. Well, if you're still watching this, I know firsthand you are a committed vapor and a committed advocate. And I applaud you, your time, energy, and resources to stay abreast on vaping news, to stay active and to foster this miracle that allows people to give up tobacco. So we're going to move on because I know that if you live in Canada and you're watching this right now, you've already done that. Moving on to New Zealand, vaping, the vast database reveals the truth. Right to vape.org. It's been a while since I've covered a new website, a new advocacy website for you guys to go check out. But here's one for you to take a look at. Right to vape.org has documented 14,000 testimonials to demonstrate the growing anger from people across the globe that are being ignored and how many people's right to choose a safer alternative is being denied. We need to demand that our rights are no less than anybody else in society. It's time for us to be first-class citizens again. 
or to become first-class citizens for the first time in our lives. Because we started smoking when we were young, before we were even considered an adult. So we've never been a first-class citizen as far as society is concerned. It's time for everyone to stand up and fight for their right to become an advocate. It's okay for you to be pissed off when things are not being done appropriately. And you need to let people know what they are doing is wrong and how it's harming you and taking away your rights as a citizen on this planet, regardless of what country you live in. Stand up, become an advocate. Fight for what's right. Fight for your right to vape, your right for harm reduction, and the rights of all the smokers that are still stuck on the addiction highway of combustible tobacco. Well, that wraps up the Global 20 Vaping New Science and Advocacy Report for the week ending August 13th, 2021. I'd say, please go become an advocate and fight for your right to vape. But I know for a fact, if you're still watching this, you already are an advocate and you've probably already saved people's lives. And I appreciate every single one of you for sticking around and fostering the mission to save people's lives. For me this week, this wraps it up. I'm going camping. I need to change my mind, get away from all this for a little bit. Get some rest respite time in the woods because this is just driving me nuts. And as far as, you know, what the format's going to be from this point forward, I, I don't really know. I know it's not worth me putting in 20, 30 hours to produce a 30-minute video that only gets 100 views a week when I did a seven minute video originally that took me less than two hours to do. And he has more views than last week's video does, especially because I rewatched last week's video a bunch of times ago. What can I do better? Can I do anything different? That would be more interesting. Doesn't matter. People just don't seem to give a shit. So that wraps it up for me. I'm out of here. I'm going camping. I'll see you on the next video, whatever it's going to be. See ya.